Today we're starting a new book, The Chaldean Oracles of Zoroaster, to which is added the hypostasis of the Archons. It'll be section 7-1. Editor's note. This book is both shorter and deeper than any of the books we've read thus far. So I'm going to try to read it a little slower and just one section at a time. It'll take a while to get through it, but I'm hoping that as you read it, as you hear it, you'll meditate on it. You'll let it really get in there because there's a lot packed in this small amount of words. Okay, with that, I will begin. The Chaldean Oracles of Zoroaster, section 7-1. Forward. The Chaldean Oracles comprise one of the most important collections of short statements, for the work is overall quite short, ever penned by mankind. Largely unknown by those outside of theology and the occult, early Gnostic writings such as this nonetheless framed the philosophical discourse, which would later give rise to Christianity itself, even as Gnosticism was oppressed and later forced underground, having fallen out of favor with the Romans, which had converted wholesale to their own quasi-Christian cult. Written sometime in the second century or thereabouts, the Chaldean oracles may have been the work of a certain Julian the Theurgist, who in this tradition claims the works were revealed by none other than Zoroaster himself. That is little where the actual origin lies, for the importance of the work revolves more around its effect upon latter philosophy, including the works of early Christians. Within this text is Hecate, referred to in various ways. This Phosphoros is indeed the feminine version of the same dispenser of wisdom alluded to in almost every religion in some form or another. The concept of hierarchy is, as is usually the case in any Gnostic text, important and central. Everything being purposefully arranged into orderly systems, one level subjected to another, or emanating from another, in a system in which above all, or above almost all, sits a central, singular, unbroken power, which has the strange capability to be everything and nothing at the same time. Encompassing all, later leads to the concept of the Christian deity as omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, even though later writings attempt to make this being more anthropic, more tangible, and more concerned truly with human existence, and with the ways of the physical world, something the Gnostic monad is unwilling generally to do, being indivisible and unmovable. From this central total force, then, comes a great set of powers, and dichotomy springs forth, witnessing and experiencing itself, after which come forth the incorporeal ethereal powers and figures of existence, as well as the more physical, normal, and mundane beings, such as humans and animals. Within the Chaldean oracles, the purpose given for man is to ignore what might be termed the more childish side of the occult and mystic, whose powers are said here to be merely toys, and is said to ponder the great philosophical hierarchy of the text and of Gnostic teaching itself. In regards to the hypostasis of the Archons, this text is rather famous among those who have studied theology or philosophy. One of the principal Gnostic writings, it details the story of Genesis, framed as it were by Gnostic principles. Here the cosmic forces responsible for the creation of various physical beings are considered evil, and rapacious as well, attempting to defile Eve's daughter. The concept of the tangible and more physical partition of the spiritual realm as chaotic, fallen, or fractured is very much present here, for the underlying principle is that of a highest, undivided force, alluded to in the oracles as well, which is unspoilt and pure. Fallen, corrupted forces then are responsible for many of the acts ascribed to the Christian God, which is seen merely the reflection, partition, or egotistical tyrant spawned by aberrant processes, which is at best no better than Satan, and at worst perhaps even more negative than the same. The state of existence that is the physical world and the spiritual realm as seen by human themselves above, which is nonetheless here considered fallen, is likened to a veil. That is, the pure spiritual force above is casting forth a projected, reflected, distorted image of the true spiritual, 
that only seems high, mighty, and cosmically important from below. The physical being, the human, then, perceives the realm above theirs as being heavenly and pure, when it is actually just a short distance from the physical realm itself, being corrupted as it were by these same forces which are further from the progenitor force than from mankind or the mundane realm itself. We may look at this in a physical way. For if a veil is placed under a light, from below one will see a dim light shining through, but from above one would see the true light as obscured, and a shadow would lie beneath it instead of light. This positional relative concept is an important one, and cannot be overlooked in other philosophies. For those not aware of this fact, Charles Manson, infamous as he is, has alluded both to this concept of the reflection of negative, as well as invoking the Gnostic Archon Abraxas. The daughter of Eve, Noria, is instructed in the hypostasis on these and other various principles by the angel Elieleth, which proceeds to claim that an undefined future date, the undominated generation will spring forth, ending the reign of fracture, physicality, and corruption, and restoring existence to its proper spiritual format. Thus concludes section 7-1, the introduction and foreword the Chaldean oracles of Zoroaster. Tomorrow we will continue with section 7-2, the Chaldean oracles of Zoroaster. I will see you then. Olam.